also that it's been uh, very nice to get to know you over the years. And we had some uh, nice conversations. And I, uh, I think actually uh, a number of things in common. <laughs> uh, well, maybe a particular uh, transatlantic lifestyle and, uh, and, uh, and of course the curly hair. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so today uh, I want to talk about uh, mean field limits for singular flows. I apologize to Frank and a number of you in the audience that you've already heard me talk about uh, this, but uh, uh, hopefully there will be a, a few uh, new things. So we want to start from a, a relatively simple question. We take a, a system of points in, uh, so it's n points uh, living in Rd. And they have an interaction energy here, Hn, which is a sum of <laughs> pair interactions. And the interaction is very specific, at least for now. Uh, we want to think of inverse powers, uh, so singular interactions that are always repulsive. Uh, so 1 over x to the s, here uh, I will call that the risk case, uh, and s but non-negative could even be negative. And or, or it could be uh, the logarithmic interaction, which is the sort of uh, limit case of S going to zero. And in particular, our motivation for looking at such, uh, at such repulsive interactions is of course the Coulomb case, because uh, the Coulomb interaction is always of this type with S equal D minus two. <coughs> okay, so then we want to let the particles evolve according to, uh, there's various possibilities, but for instance, the gradient flow. So you see here, it's in a mean field scaling. So the velocity of each particle is uh, like the average uh, force or the average gradient of the energy uh, uh, generated by the other uh, particles. You can also look at conservative versions of this. What I mean by that is, here, the gradient is multiplied by some anti-symmetric operator. So the energy will be conserved. Uh, an example of motivation for this is the point vortex system uh, for fluids uh, in 2D, for instance, where you take the gradient of the energy, which is logarithmic, and then you rotate it by pi over 2, so you fall exactly in uh, this class. Uh, and as you know, the physical, uh, really physical law would be Newton's law where the acceleration of each particle is the average force uh, generated by the other particles. And then if you want, and uh, I know that, Frank, you're not uh, really a probabilist at heart, but if you wanted, you could add some noise. Um, here, where theta is a temperature, and wit are just uh, an independent Brownian motion, so the simplest uh, possibility of a way of adding diffusion. OK, so of course, the goal is here to understand the limit as n goes to infinity. When there's many particles, understand the effective uh, evolution of the system. So the way to do it when you have a general question like this, so here I rewrote with a, a more general uh, interaction kernel here. Uh, first, you know, the question is really to understand the limit of the empirical measures. So you form the empirical measure, which is the sum of Dirac at uh, Dirac masses at all the moving points, divided by n, that's a probability uh, measure, and you uh, ask whether as n goes to infinity, you have a limiting probability density, mu t, which will depend on t, and what is the uh, evolution of mu t. Another way of looking at it is uh, by looking at probability densities on uh, particle, uh, <coughs> particle distributions. So if you give yourself Fn0 of x1 and xn, which is a, a density of probability on configuration space, that gives you the, you know, how you, your, your distribution of uh, configurations at the initial data. And then you ask yourself, what is Fnt, the corresponding probability density, at later times? Uh, and here there is a, a notion which is called propagation of chaos, which says basically uh, you ask whether there is propagation of chaos, meaning if you know that <coughs> at the initial time your uh, 
distribution is essentially IID, or if you want, it's tensorized. So it, there is no dependence between the points. Each particle is distributed according to a, an initial uh, density mu naught. Then if it's true that at later times you keep this uh, factorized situation uh, up to a smaller order terms possibly, then you say you have propagation of chaos. And the way you measure uh, this closeness here is usually taken in the sense that you look at fixed k-point marginals of this long distribution and you show convergence of each of them. So it turns out that if you can prove uh, this, the convergence of the empirical measure, essentially you prove that. You, you deduce propagation of chaos. Okay, so uh, sometimes it will be just more convenient to work with this when we're in the probabilistic setting. But in general, I'm going to talk about empirical measure convergence. So what is the limit that we expect? So as I said, the limiting uh, uh, distribution evolves in time and we, we expect that it solves the PDE. Uh, which you can easily guess by formal computation. So either uh, you use this uh, conservation relation when you have a moving Dirac mass, uh, it's time derivative, plus the divergence of the velocity times the Dirac mass equals zero. <coughs> and you sort of plug in the law uh, for the velocity. Or you can do it at the level of these uh, n particle densities by using what's called a forward Kolmogorov or Liouville equations. <coughs> you have a hierarchy on such uh, densities. Um, and you can plug in, if you formally assume that it's tensorized, you will find uh, the proper PDE. And what is the PDE? So it's this one. OK, so dt mu, you see it follows this uh, sort of model. It's the divergence of uh, the limiting, what you expect as the limiting um, velocity, which is the convolution of your kernel with mu, times mu. And then if you have a noise, you get an extra diffusion term, an extra Laplacian with the temperature in front. OK, so uh, a certain type of, of PD. So I will call this one MF, like mean field. OK, so it, it will come back. The notation will come back. If you're in a second order case, uh, you know that the way to express the limit is uh, in kinetic formulation. <coughs> so you have to look at uh, not a density of particles, but a density in uh, position and velocity. So here it's denoted rho, rho of xv. Uh, and it will solve uh, a kinetic equation. So here you have free transport. Here you have the effect of the force. And here you have the possible uh, diffusion. Uh, and mu, the density that's here, of course, is the position uh, marginal of the density. So it's called Vlasov or Vlasov Poisson if the interaction is Poisson or Malkin Vlasov, etc. OK, so how can we prove convergence to this uh, limiting PD? Because I told you the derivation so far has been formal. Uh, so there's a number of methods. Uh, the more uh, traditional uh, or earliest method <coughs> is a trajectorial one. You, you compare the trajectories of uh, the particles to basically the characteristics uh, for the limit equation, and you show that if they remain close, uh, sorry, if they start close, they remain close. And that method works uh, when uh, k, what I wrote k, the, the so maybe I will write this on the board. K for us will be later gradient of G or anti-symmetric times gradient of G. OK, so I go sometimes from one to the other. Uh, so if K is Lipschitz, that works well. But we are talking about very singular interactions. So uh, this method uh, will not work. And then uh, there's a certain number of methods that consist in finding a good metric. Um, so typically, Wasserstein metrics are used quite a bit, uh, for which you have a certain stability. So you, you want to prove that the time derivative of the distance between uh, two solutions <coughs> is controlled by the distance between the two solutions itself. And then, of course, you can apply Grandval's lemma and show that if initially 
they are very close, they remain close. So the idea is first you should try to apply this to two solutions of the limiting equations, right? You, you, you have the, your mean field equation, you, you better hope that this is true at that level. And then later you can try to apply it to uh, one measure, which is uh, the empirical uh, measure. So mu nt, that's the empirical measure for the actual discrete evolution. And the other one, uh, that is the limiting evolution. Right, so that's what you can hope to do. And that will quantify uh, convergence in this metric to your limiting um, thing. And then there is the relative entropy method. So it consists in, again, showing a Grandval type of relation, but for uh, relative entropy. So here it's, uh, it's phrased at the level of these density functions. So you look at Fn, relative entropy of Fn, relative to rho tensorized n times, some limiting density rho. So it's defined like this. Uh, of course, as you know, relative entropy is not negative, so it is a kind of a metric, in, even though it's not a distance. Uh, and this method works uh, well if you have temperature. So actually, you need temperature for the method to work. If you don't have temperature, um, it's not going to help. And with uh, that idea, Jabin and Wang were able to prove uh, convergence for kernel scale that are much less regular than before, so at least much less regular than what was assumed here, for instance. So W minus 1 infinity is essentially what they treat, but always with temperature. Right? Uh, and then there is the particular Coulomb case, which I told you is a uh, uh, a big interest uh, motivation for these types of questions I'm asking. Uh, and, and there were uh, certainly results in 2D, because in 2D the Coulomb interaction is logarithmic. And uh, the logarithm, in fact, is not very singular. You know, it's singular, but barely. Uh, and, and so because of the motivation of the point vortex system, this, system, uh, this question had been uh, answered with famous uh, papers uh, of, that are listed here. So you can get convergence, whether it's gradient flow or conservative flow in the 2D log case. Uh, and there were other uh, results that work in low dimension. In particular, uh, this, uh, this paper of uh, Mitya Durinx was the first one to use this modulated energy method that I'm going to present. At the time, it was limited to dimensions one and two. So I, I want to mention also that for um, the second order evolution, which is actually a harder problem in some sense. So when you expect convergence to Vlasov Poisson, Vlasov Reese in our case, uh, essentially uh, everything has been stuck at the level of the Coulomb interaction. So, uh, so these papers here treated the case where S is less than D minus two. So I remind you that S is the power in the interaction. So it's essentially that. Okay, so you can go up to D minus two, but not all the way to D minus two. Uh, so that's a sort of big open question in the topic. Uh, and so the only cases that have been done here assume some kind of, or add some sort of artificial um, cutoff of the interaction. Okay, so, uh, so now I want to introduce the, the method that uh, I alluded to, which is the modulated energy method. And um, originally, it was introduced in a different context, the context of Ginzburg-Landau uh, equations. So here are the equations. There is a parabolic uh, version. And there is a Schrodinger version, which is a, a nonlinear Schrodinger equation, uh, but that goes by the name gross pitaevsky in physics. <coughs> and here Psi is a uh, complex valued. And usually we study this in 2D, so it's the simplest setting. Uh, and the important objects here are the vortices, which are the zeros of Psi. Uh, that come with a topological degree, okay? Because it's complex valued. Whenever you have a zero, you have a degree of the zero, and these are really physical objects. 
Uh, and you have to understand this in the limit when epsilon goes to zero, the parameter that's here. And this is uh, the epsilon going to zero is really forcing the vortex structure to emerge. Uh, and the vortex size, the core sizes uh, to go to zero. So these things essentially become points in, the, in this limit, epsilon goes to zero. And so this is why it's related to the original problem, because in the end they become points with logarithmic uh, interaction, which is a particular case of what we're discussing. Um, and so the goal was to derive some limiting uh, dynamics for this problem. So let me show you the energy. So it's of course, you know, when you have a equation like that, you know that there is an energy, no surprise here. And uh, what, what I proved is that, okay, I, I wrote the theorem in a pretty sketchy way. There are some assumptions on initial energy, not too much initial energy or well-prepared data, if you want. The regularity of the limit of the initial data and the number of vortices. So what's important really is this n epsilon. We are in regimes where there's many uh, vortices as epsilon goes to zero. So n epsilon has to tend to infinity. Um, as epsilon goes to zero. So you will have a mean field limit for that reason, because you're, there's going to be many, many vortices, just like in the beginning, I'm starting with many, many points. But there are some assumptions on these regimes of how fast you go to infinity, because here there's like a sort of diagonal limit, right? And that I don't want to specify uh, for today. Okay, and the result is that if you look at the current, which is defined in this way. Here you take a brackets or a complex uh, scalar product, basically. Uh, these currents, properly normalized, converge to some uh, velocity field, V of t, which is solution to a fluid-like equation. So if it's a uh, Gross-Pitaevsky, Gross-Pitaevsky, you know, conserves energy. Uh, in fact, the limiting equation is uh, Euler's equation the incompressible Euler equation. Then uh, it's an equation you know well. And if I look at the parabolic version, uh, which is uh, dissipating energy, uh, then it's a sort of dissipative version of Euler, which I didn't write, but so you imagine you take Euler in 2D and somehow you rotate the vector field uh, to make it uh, dissipate energy. Okay, so there is convergence. If you're interested in convergence of the vorticity, it's implied by this convergence of the currents. And what I want to emphasize uh, more than the result is the method. The method consists in twisting the energy uh, to make, to, to build uh, what I call a modulated energy. So you remember probably the energy from the previous slide, right? It's this one. Now look at it and on the next slide, you see the only change is this. Here, uh, you stick in uh, minus i psi and v of t, where v is your limit, is your expected limiting field. So the way it is inserted, uh, it's basically inserted like a gauge, like an artificial gauge that you add to the system. Uh, and then you want to differentiate in time this quantity uh, and show a grand vial type relation so that you can prove that the time derivative of the quantity is controlled by the quantity itself. And uh, it works. I mean, miraculously it works. And so it shows that, you know, if initially this modulated energy is not, is small, then it remains small and that proves convergence, that implies the convergence. So it's a sort of metric, if you want, that is a sort of tailored to the energy and to the situation of the equation. And uh, the reason for the name uh, modulated energy was by analogy with, uh, uh, you know, relative entropy or modulated entropy methods. Okay, so this actually was the, the first version of it on a model that was much more complex than the initial uh, question I wanted to ask. Uh, but in fact, it's the same. So if you look at it carefully, uh, it's going to be, uh, uh, really, the, the discrete version is going to be what I present now. So now I want to go back to the initial problem where I have my endpoints and my um, RIS interaction energy. Uh, and now what is the modulated energy going to be? Uh, well, it's defined like that. 
And as I said, somewhere it's the same as the previous one, but that's not obvious, possibly. Um, so you, you have your interaction G, and you have two distributions, mu and nu, with same uh, mass, so let's say two probability densities. And you define this sort of Reese metric, which is a double integral of g x minus y, mu minus u of x, mu minus nu of y. Okay, so this is the metric squared. Uh, so, so you see it's, it's, tail, it's based on the energy, right? Uh, on the other hand, you can see that it, it is a metric. It's not so hard to see that it's positive. You can look at it. You can look at it in Fourier if you like. In fact, if G is uh, precisely this interaction, it's just a, a negative <coughs> Sobolev's uh, norm, right? It's just some uh, H dot D minus S over two norm. So good. Now later, I'm going to talk a, a little bit about relaxing this uh, very precise uh, relation, and then you can continue to take the same definition. Then it's no longer a Sobolev norm, but. And the main point is that you can observe what you want, which is there is a, a uniqueness and stability property at the level of the solutions of the limiting equation for this norm. So you can prove that if you take two solutions of the limiting equation, uh, you, you have this type of Grandval uh, relation that the distance squared between the two solutions is controlled by an exponential in time times the initial distance squared. And the important point here is that the constant in the exponential depends only on one of the solutions. Okay, so I decide here it depends on the second solution. So the second solution has to have enough regularity that I can talk about the L infinity norm of that. But I don't need to assume anything on the first solution. So that's why it's a weak strong uniqueness property. So one solution is strong and one solution is weak. So any weak solutions that start close to a strong solution will stay close. And that's encouraging because uh, we can hope to plug in for uh, mu one t, you can hope to, to try to pu put the actual empirical measure, which is in some sense a weak solution of the equation. There is a twist, however, which is that if you plug in a uh, empirical measures in this definition, you get infinity because, uh, because of the self-interaction of every point, right? This is like a total interaction of, uh, of uh, the system formed by the charges mu and the charges minus mu. So Dirac's here would give you g of zero, which is infinity. This is because of that. So we take for modulated energy instead, uh, we take the same thing. So you put in here the empirical measure, but you remove the diagonal when you integrate. So you remove the self-interaction of the particles, that would be infinite. And so this is going to be the modulated energy for a configuration relative to, or if you want, modulated by a limiting solution mu, but in the end we're going to take here mu to be mu t, that solves the mean field equation. But in principle, you could define this thing in red for any distribution mu, any probability density mu that you like. Okay, so when you've done that, you have a definition, but now it's no longer clear that this thing is a metric. Because by removing the diagonal, you sort of mess up with the positivity, uh, and uh, that could be problematic. It's also not clear that you're going to be able to close the Grandval uh, inequality, however, well, it works. So let me state uh, the theorem. So this is a theorem with no temperature, no noise. So that's why I say theta equals zero. And the theorem assumes that you have a regular enough solution to the mean field equation. Okay, so the equation with the limit here. Uh, maybe it's not worth uh, looking at all the assumptions. But you can really phrase them into an, uh, an assumption on the initial data. Okay, so if you have an initial data that has a nice density, and if you know to propagate uh, a certain regularity at the level of a limiting PDE, uh, then you can work. And so big T here is going to be the maximal time uh, of existence of my nice solution. Uh, and then uh, we can show that the uh, modulated energy at time t is controlled 
by the modulated energy at time zero, plus something that's small, and you see it's quantitative, it's a negative power of n, so something that tends to zero uh, algebraically, and of course some exponential in time. <coughs> okay, and uh, the, uh, there is a separate study inside the proof that says that this is actually a good metric, and so in particular, from this result, you deduce that if you have an initial uh, situation with modulated energy that tends to zero, then at later times tends to zero as well. And so for, and for every time you can deduce the convergence. So it is, it is if you want like a metric, and you deduce the convergence of the empirical measures that you want. So this result, okay, first I proved it uh, in this regime S between D minus two and D. Uh, so I want to emphasize that asking that S is less than D is natural because um, when S is bigger than D, uh, the kernel here is no longer integrable <coughs> near zero. And so the convolutions don't even make sense. So the, the, the sort of mean field uh, approach is, is in fact wrong. The, the limiting uh, evolution is very different. So it's a different regime. Uh, D minus two, as you know, is Coulomb. Okay, so it was the first time that the Coulomb case was included. Uh, and below D minus two, you had other proofs. Uh, however, it, it remained a bit as a, at first, a question whether a modulated energy proof could work for S less than D minus two. Somehow it, it was harder to do the easier case, less than D minus two, than the harder case S bigger than D minus two, but we were able to make it work. Uh, in this paper with Hang Nguyen and Matt Rosenzweig. Okay, so um, before I get into the idea, a few comments. There were some extensions. Uh, you, you can uh, relax a little bit the assumptions of regularity. So with the results of Matt Rosenzweig, in the Coulomb case, you only need to assume that your density uh, at initial time is bounded. You see, that's, that's quite, quite remarkable, in fact. Uh, we now can prove a sharp rate, at least in all these risk cases. Uh, when I gave you this uh, negative, you see here there is an additive error, right, that sort of uh, gives a, a rate of convergence that you can't go beyond. And uh, the exponent, this beta, can be made explicit. And that's sharp, in fact. And um, if you're interested in the second order evolution, I told you in these types of uh, interactions, it's called Vlasov Poisson, or Vlasov Ries, you can call it. Um, so the method, the modulated energy method, was made to work uh, in, in, in our paper with Mitya Duranx uh, in the monokinetic case. So that's a particular situation where you assume that your um, distribution of uh, position velocity uh, at each point is a Dirac in the velocity. So there is a unique velocity uh, at a given point, as opposed to a possible distribution like a Gaussian in velocities. Now you have a unique velocity. Then you have particular uh, solutions of uh, Vlasov, Poisson, Ries. Um, and in that case, you can make the modulated energy uh, method work. So that's still something even though the full uh, situation remains open. Okay, if you're interested in the situation where you have noise, so, peop so, so people are interested in that too, relations to statistical mechanics in particular. Uh, okay, the modulated energy method can also work. It works, in fact, for all the cases that are subcoulombic. Okay, so what I call subcoulombic is S less than D minus two. So uh, you can look at the expectation of the modulated energy and examine its evolution in time, and that suffices. But when you go to the supercoulombic case, so S bigger than D minus two, that doesn't work. And uh, there was a, a very nice, um, uh, a thing uh, done by Bress, Jabin, and Wang, which is that they were able to realize that you should combine basically the relative entropy method 
that they had been using and the modulated energy method and put them together into a new quantity that is called now a modulated free energy. And what is the modulated free energy? So you see here you put theta, the temperature, so it's going to be called like that. F calligraphic, there is some density, density of particle distribution Fn. Rho is your limiting density. And you look at theta times the relative entropy. And you add to that the average modulated energy. So that's my modulated energy from before but you integrate it uh, with respect to the density uh, Fn. Okay, so it's sort of expectation of modulated energy. And that quantity is really good. It has the structure of a free energy in physics, free energy being temperature times entropy plus energy. And it's really good because um, when you differentiate it in time, there are some, uh, some very nasty terms that come from a uh, basically the Ito calculus uh, related to the, to the noise and that bring out terms like that. And you really don't want terms like that because you know G is already singular but Laplace and G is even worse. Uh, and previously everything was stuck because of these terms but when you do it like that, when you differentiate in time here you get terms like that. When you differentiate in times here, you also get terms like that and they exactly cancel because you have put exactly the right constants in front. So uh, that's because it's actually the correct structure to work with. Okay, so now with that method, you can do the case with noise all the way to S equals D. And uh, they were even able to look at attractive logarithmic interactions with this method and prove with that convergence to uh, the limiting evolution, which is in this case pat like keller segel uh, So that was also an open problem. Okay, so now let's go back to what we obtained. So we looked at this modulated energy Fn. And I told you the main point is to differentiate it in time. So you have the moving particles, right? And you have your limiting density. So you can differentiate this explicitly in time. You want to use the fact that you, this solves the PDE. You use the fact that this solves a certain ODE system. Okay, and when you compute, you find yourself with uh, this quantity. So it's not a difficult computation, but you find yourself with that. Okay, so you have here the empirical measure, your limiting density. And here there is a vector field, psi, that comes out. And the particular psi that you need that's going to pop out is related to the limiting density. So this thing, that's why we assume the limiting solution is smooth, you know, it's regular, is for this vector field to be nice. Okay, so the question is, can you control this quantity by the modulated energy itself, right? So the answer is yes, and I, I claim that this is a functional inequality, right? So this has, in fact, nothing to do with the underlying dynamics. You can forget that you're looking at particular solutions and sub evolutions, and then you can ask this question for any uh, configuration of points, any uh, any um, uh, density mu, uh, any vector field psi regular enough. So in fact, here you see it needs to be Lipschitz. Uh, can you prove that this thing is controlled uh, by the energy plus something small? Okay, so in fact, we proved this and so first it was done uh, in this uh, regime between D minus 2 and D. Then uh, with Matt Rosenzweig and Hang and Yen, we extended to S less than Z minus 2, and we also realized, in case you were interested in that, that you, you don't really have to be exactly Reese. You can be Reese like. So, Reese like would be say, okay, the thing blows up near zero, but it's bounded above and below by Reese interactions. Uh, and also at infinity, it decays bounded above and below by Reese interaction. So you have a bit of room. And also the Fourier transform has to have also similar behavior. 
But that, that allows some sort of wiggling around uh, the precise, very rigid uh, risk interaction. We call that a commutator estimate now. And the reason is, if you, uh, so we're going to denote f, the difference between the empirical measure and the reference measure, okay, that appears here. So it's this sort of uh, neutral charge distribution, if you want. And you can see that what you're doing here is uh, psi dot grad g convolved with f minus g convolved. So you're doing two operations, uh, dotting with psi, taking gradients, taking convolutions, but you're doing them in different orders. And you can actually write this in terms of a commutator here. So these types of uh, integrals, uh, they actually appear you know, in, in, in singular integrals business. There's a paper that's recent on proving similar inequalities, but they all assume that the divergence of the vector field is zero, which we don't have. Uh, and somehow they don't prove the inequality we need anyway, because, uh, and also we have this big problem of removing the diagonal here that remains at the level of this inequality as well. But in fact, I'm going to show you a proof that's quite short, at least in concept, uh, even though there is some technicalities. Sylvia, yeah. can one take S to be D plus I gamma or gamma is possible? Okay, D. Plus I got but D already, uh, it's, n it's not in the range, right? You don't want know, D. That, no. Oh, I see. You want, to, you want to regularize this way. D plus I gamma. Ooh. Yes, I see where you're coming. Uh, I, I, I don't know. I, I wouldn't know how to do that off the top of my head. But maybe we can. OK, I understand what you mean. Yeah, that's an interesting uh, possibility. OK, so this, this thing you see is the core. and. Once you have that, that inequality, uh, then you have your grand vase argument and blah. So, so that's the main point. Um, it was actually uh, used quite quickly uh, to, to treat the quantum Coulomb mean field limit, for instance. So uh, there's works of Francois Gauls, who I think I saw this morning, uh, Matt Rosenzweig, also quasi-neutral limits. Uh, which are a different uh, regime where you get to different limiting equations, uh, use this uh, proposition as a, as a sort of main building block. So you see, it's, it's kind of plausible, this inequality, for the following reason. Because you have a Lipschitz vector field psi, so psi of x minus psi of y dot gradient g. Here you have an inverse power, right? So when you take the gradient, you get inverse power with an extra power. But this you bound by x minus y. So at the level of the homogeneity, it is like the homogeneity of the energy. So I remind you, the modulated energy itself is the same thing. Uh, I'm abbreviating with this notation f. Uh, however, you cannot use that to make a proof, right, th this argument, because you need to take advantage of the cancellation that's in f, uh, and otherwise you would be taking absolute values here, and you cannot do that. Okay. So let me show you the, the idea of the proof in the Coulomb case only, because the Coulomb case is particular, because as you know, the Coulomb interaction is the fundamental solution to the Laplacian. And that simplifies uh, a lot of the stuff. So we're going to use a, an electric rewriting of the energy by thinking in terms of the electric potential. So given a distribution f, right, like that, that I had before, take the convolution of f with g, that's the electric potential, call that hf. So if you happen to be in the Coulomb case, then uh, it solves a Poisson equation, right? Minus Laplacian HF is proportional to F. So that's a nice fact that you wouldn't have for other uh, interactions. And now this interaction that I had here, I can rewrite it as HF times F. Uh, so just by using that, I, I take one convolution. 
But this f, I can rewrite it from the above equation as the Laplacian up to multiplicative constants. And so now you have h Laplacian h, you integrate by parts with Green's formula, you have integral of grad hf squared. And so you've transformed this double integral into a single integral expressed in terms of the electric potential. So that's kind of nice, except it neglects the issue of the diagonal. Uh, you know, the, so the self-interaction problem is sort of neglected. So at the level of Fn, where I remove the diagonal, this positivity that I observe here is still not clear. Uh, so that's where the, the proof becomes uh, delicate or requires some ideas. And one of the ideas is to use some truncations of the electric potential, because this potential, in fact, blows up uh, because of all the Dirac's, at each Dirac it blows up. Uh, so you want to replace the Dirac's by some smeared Dirac's. Uh, so delta xi ri is going to be a, a measure of mass 1, but that's supported on a, on a ball of radius ri. And the, the smearing uh, scale are, uh, here is chosen to be ri, depends on the point and is directly related to the nearest neighbor distance. So it's made so that the smeared balls remain disjoint and also exploits a monotonicity of the energy with respect to the smearing parameter. So if you have smeared balls and if you sort of extend your smearing on larger and larger ball, it actually decreases the interaction. So that's very useful. So this is just a buzzword about how we deal with this uh, removal of the diagonal. And now let's go back to this uh, model case. Um, next step is we introduce the stress energy tensor. It's written like this. And the big um, point about the stress tensor is that it satisfies this relation. If you take the divergence of this thing, you, you get essentially Laplacian h times gradient h. So that's an explicit computation. Uh, that's, that's kind of well known. And it's true as long as f is sufficiently regular. OK? So now we go back to our question. We have to control these types of double integrals. And here I'm, doing, uh, I'm giving you the cheated version, right, where I, I put back the diagonal. So uh, we write this. We separate psi of x minus psi of y into two pieces. So we sort of re uh, desymmetrize the problem. Right? So you get twice the same term. And uh, when you get grad G convolved with F, you can replace it by HF. That's the, that's the potential, right? HF is G convolved with F. So I can replace by gradient HF times F. So now I have a single integral, not a double integral. And in red, you see this term that's gradient HF times DF. And that's exactly the terms that we have here. So we can express the ter term in red as a divergence of the stress tensor. And then you're in business because you integrate by parts, put the derivatives onto psi, the vector field. And you observe that this uh, stress tensor thing is pointwise actually bounded by the gradient of hf squared. And so if you go back to the previous page, you see you bound by this right hand side, but that's also the initial energy. So here, in this very simple case, that's Coulomb, neglecting the problem of self-interactions, we have a sort of three-line proof of the inequality. Then, as I said, this needs to be renormalized to take care of the uh, removal of the safe in interaction. And the key word is this truncation procedure that I vaguely uh, described in terms of smearing the charges. And then if you want to go beyond the Coulomb case or the Ries case, uh, in the end, we were able to dispense with this uh, stress energy st tensor structure, which is very convenient, but also very rigid. And so without using too fancy stuff, so no power product commutator estimates in particular, we found a purely space-based uh, way of proving the estimate that uses some, you know, some harmonic analysis but not too much, and that allows to um, relax a little bit, as I said, these types of very strict uh, structure of the interaction. Okay, so that's the uh, ideas behind the proof. Now, if you want to go beyond, 
there's many questions that you can ask, and I, I think one uh, natural one is, could we get better in terms of uh, global in time convergence? Because I, I showed you, because you use ground vars inequality, of course your convergence is going to be uh, at a rate that deteriorates exponentially in time. And for these um, gradient flow dynamics, in fact, we don't believe that it's so bad. Um, okay, so there's a first approach that's been put forward uh, here by Guillain Lebris uh, Montmarché, which is to uh, to use the relative entropy method and to combine it with functional uh, inequalities, you know, of uh, LSI types. To use the fact that when you have entropy dissipation, you get a negative term, and you can uh, you can then bound it uh, from above in terms of the uh, uh, relative entropy itself. So that has worked, uh, but. This is in the setting where you have noise, because that's the setting where the relative entropy method works. And it's the setting of the first Jabin Wong paper, which I told you treats interactions that are a bit singular, but not too singular. So I said W minus one infinity. Uh, that's, the, that's the kind of setting. And with that, they were able to get global in time convergence. Uh, so with Matt Rosenzweig, we, we examine the same question, but in this uh, RIS uh, setting and with a different idea. The idea is if you can prove decay of the limiting solution, decay in time uh, with a certain rate, then you can use that to obtain a uniform in time convergence. So for instance, you know, uh, what we believe is if you have a cloud of particles with the risk repulsion, what, what they're going to do is very simple. They're just going to spread uh, to infinity, right? Because they repel each other. There's no confinement. Um, and so the solution itself, the mu t, is going to decay. So this is one uh, example. So, so far, we've only been uh, made it work in the case where you add noise. Uh, the reason is that when you have noise, then you have a Laplacian in your equation. And the diffusion in the equation helps to tame the solutions. And so uh, this is uh, something we did. For instance, we proved that, so it's in the sub-Coulomb case with noise. We proved that the solution, so this is really a PD study at the level of the limiting equation, decays in time with a certain power here that's explicit. Uh, so it's sort of, the proof is a la Carl and loss, but different because we don't have divergence-free vector fields. And the other main point is we looked at the functional inequality and we looked at the vector field to which we have to apply it. And when you optimize the functional inequality better, you notice that the constant in front here, uh, in this uh, inserting what the precise psi t must be, uh, is controlled in terms of the L infinity norm of the solution. So now we know the L infinity norm decays at a certain rate. And so when you plug that into ground value, you're going to be integrating a decaying function. And so that now is going to converge in time instead of gi giving you an exponential. And uh, with that, uh, you see, so this is the setting, subcoulombic. It works in dimensions bigger than 3. Uh, and you have this equation with the diffusion, the, the Laplacian term. Then you can bound the expectation of the modulated energy by the initial one plus something small. And you see now it doesn't depend on t. Right? There is no, uh, so it's a uniform in time estimate. So uh, we're continuing to explore this uh, idea uh, now in, the super Coulomb, in a super Coulomb case. We also wanted to get decay, use the temperature to help us with that. And uh, we set ourselves in the torus because uh, the torus is easier uh, in terms of uh, controlling things. Uh, and so now the solution doesn't decay. It, uh, it equi equilibrates to the constant solution, right? In the torus, it's going to be a uniform uh, limiting density of points. And so it's the derivatives of the solutions that are going to converge to 0. And when you're in the torus, Instead of having uh, algebraic convergence in time, you can even have exponential convergence in time. And so with that, we prove this result that gives us global in-time convergence in terms 
of the modulated free energy, which is the quantity you have to use in that case. Uh, so you see with the constant that's uniform in time. And an additive error, which is also sharp and optimized, if you want to have sharp rates. And the other thing that we've been exploring is um, the attractive uh, log gas situation. So I mentioned that with these uh, generalizations of the modulated, modulated free energy method, you can now allow for a little bit of attraction in the uh, interaction. And that's log in 2D, because log in 2D is basically the amount of attraction that you can tame by the relative entropy. You see, the relative entropy behaves like a sort of uh, logarithmic repulsion, so it can sort of balance the logarithmic attraction. And uh, we found some sort of new phenomenon, which is that if you have sufficient temperature, everything works out well, and you get uniform in time um, convergence, but if you are below a certain critical temperature, you uh, can be in a situation where you, you can prove there is no uniform in time convergence. So the, uh, the, the, the basically it's because of the, the possibilities of instabilities of your uh, limiting solution. When the temperature is too low, you don't have enough of this, uh, of this entropic uh, repulsion. Okay, so I think I'm done. And I want to say happy birthday. Bon anniversaire, Franck. Are there some questions or remarks on... Uh, yes? Can you just say in a few words how you use the, the, this dispersion estimate together with, say, how you, you put in the... Uh, the global strategy. The dispersion estimate, what do you call uh, uh, the, well, the decay? Uh, yeah, T minus two. This one? Yeah. Uh, so you see, you plug it here. Uh, so here, this is the sort of functional inequality that's made more quantitative in terms of the of the mu. So here now, I can replace by T to my negative power. So it's just and then it's just gone back. Okay, so it's, it's, it's really about uh, observing the functional inequality and seeing that you can, you can quantify it in terms of the density of points itself, which had not been done before. So now we're, we're trying to extend this uh, to situations without noise and uh, with some, for example, confinement potential that would be uh, more desirable, more general. Uh, so, so always exploit these ideas of convergence in time to get uniform rates. Can you just explain why you expect this homogeneity of the, this uh, dependence respect to the LMP time? Uh, this one? No, the, the, you get this, this constant. So, uh, so, so yeah, that's the scaling, in fact. Uh, when you have a density of points, um, you have the interaction that has a power s, and uh, you, when you look at how the interaction scales, it's going to bring you a, a mu to the s over d. That's a natural. Uh, so, so there is a, a natural length scale is mu to the one over d, and then you have the power s. So that's an interaction. So that's mu to the s over d. And here you also have to plug in that it's psi t, which is the gradient of that. So I think that gives you an extra. Factors. I, I don't remember off the top of my head exactly uh, how this turns out, but it's all more or less natural from the point of view of scaling. It's not. Uh, Some other questions or remarks? Maybe I have a ni very nice question mm -hmm. uh, from in the beginning of your talk. So you suppose that initially your Dirac measures converge to some measure which is absolutely continuous with respect yes. to the Dirac measure. Mm -hmm. but are there some results when the limit is a measure which is not absolutely continuous with respect to the Dirac measure? But then, you, you, first you have a PD problem, right? Can you My feeling is that your problem can be a problem on a measure, not necessarily on a function, right? Yes, yes, the it's, it's true, but can you give, can you give, can you give, uh, can you 
Can you call for me the PDE with initial data? Uh, <coughs> I cannot prove anything of these PDEs, but I mean, why we suppose that the, initial, the limit <laughs> is uh, uh, absolutely continuous with respect to the level of measure? That's what I don't know. So uh, not only you need that, you need L infinity, at least in our proof. So there, the density has, has to be a density, and the density has to be L infinity. Now, I can tell you that, in fact, there are, ca there are examples. You can sort of build counterexamples of initial distributions that are uh, singular, mm -hmm. so for example, supported on a line or something mm -hmm. like that, and in which you have non-uniqueness. Ah, so there is a new phenomenon. So, so there, are, there are real difficulties. It's not just that uh, we... So, so the reason why we need L infinity, probably it could possibly be relaxed, but you cannot go as far as going to just energy space. I don't think that's in a, that's. A I think that's. So the already that's on the level yeah. of when it's for the there is a density, very nicely, I just imagine why not to take a half of the like measure for some density. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. So it's it. it I would love to explore these kind of questions and understand what's the minimal assumption that you can place, but it turns out it's not easy. I think that even on glass of Poisson, it's why always we suppose that the initial data, for instance, I know some, I have always asked myself, I never worked on this problem, but always I say, this is my first question, why we No, it, it's because you, you need it in the proof. You're already happy if you can get something under some regularity assumptions. That's the first thing to understand, right? And then okay. if you can understand that, you can try to relax your well, assumptions as much as you can want, but we are not there yet. Uh, so okay. yes, I agree with your question. But, uh. So maybe there are some other questions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so let's thank uh, Sylvia.